Good evening. My name is Moira Shuri, and I'm the Executive Director of Zocalo Public Square. Welcome to our discussion on Can Humans Coexist with Monster Wildfires, presented in partnership with the Huntingdon USC Institute on California and the West. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to each other. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish ideas, journalism, and convene events like the one we're watching today. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. Today's discussion on wildfires, human life, and the changing climate is moderated by Nathan Rott. As a National Desk Correspondent for NPR, Nathan covers the environment and the American West. He is also an experienced wildlands firefighter. Over to you, Nathan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zocalo Public Square for tonight's discussion on a topic that's becoming increasingly relevant, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. That is, how do we humans coexist with monster wildfires? My name is Nate Rott, and usually I report on wildfire and the environment for NPR in the field or recording studios, or now uh, the inside of my closet because nothing dampens the sound quite like a bunch of unused collared shirts. But tonight, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you for a conversation with three brilliant people, our panelists for tonight's talk. First up, Fernanda Santos, a journalist, author, and professor of practice at Arizona State University's Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Fernando was previously with the Phoenix Bureau was the previously the, the Phoenix Bureau Chief at the New York Times, where she worked for 12 years, and she's the author of The Fireline, the story of the Granite Mountain Hotshots, a deeply reported book about the tragic Yarnell Hill fire in Arizona in 2013. Our next panelist is Teresa Greger, a descendant of the Epi Nation of Santa Isabel and the Yoami Nation, and an assistant professor in American Indian Studies at California State University, Long Beach. She was previously the executive director of the Intertribal Long-Term Recovery Foundation. Finally, our last panelist is Jared Dahl Aldern, a historical, a historical ecologist, educator, and fire practitioner, or fire lighter. He has collaborated with and learned from indigenous people throughout California on prescribed and cultural burns, and he is an affiliated research scholar at the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West. Thank you everyone for joining us with this conversation tonight and taking the time and let's get to it. All right, to start, I thought it might be helpful to give those watching or listening a bit of a status update on the current fire season because it is mid July and this is not a typical year. There's this thing called the coronavirus. I, I don't know, you guys may have heard of it. And Fernanda, I thought we could start with you since you happen to live in a place that has one of the earlier fire seasons in the West. What has fire season been like so far for people out on the front lines who are not only dealing with fire, but a pandemic as well? It's great to be here, Nate. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so Arizona not only is one of the earliest states in terms of fires, but it's also the state that has right now one of the worst uh, records in terms of spread and positivity of tests in the uh, pandemic. Um, so while here in Phoenix, where I live, you know, we're more concerned about staying home, staying away from people, keeping ourselves safe. There have been fires burning in the state. Um, some of the largest fires that have burned so far this year are here in Arizona. Uh, one near the Tucson in the southeastern part of the state and one in the north central part of the state. And both of these fires forced evacuations. Um, both of these fires uh, threatened um, uh, property. Um, and uh, both of these fires burned with many fire crews on the ground uh, trying to contain the spread to then minimize the, the damage while also keeping in mind that there is a, um, a, a healthy, there is a benefit to fire in the forest. Um, so the challenge this year is that while in the past, all it took was there's a fire burning. Once there is a need for a big response, a fire camp would spring up within a matter of hours in, let's say, uh, an empty high school or, you know, the, the, the county fairgrounds um, with showers, with uh, dining halls, with rooms full of fire 
people um, who are man people who are managing those fires close together, huddling over maps, talking on the radio, discussing all the actions for the day, and trying to uh, outsmart the fire to to plan for the day ahead. Fire and weather both together. This year they had to do it very very differently. They have had to do it very very differently. They've had to uh, keep in mind the fact that they have to stay uh, distant. Um, Camps no longer have the types of camaraderie that you would find in the dining halls because the crew, while the crews could stay together because they're out there on the line fighting the fire together, they couldn't co-mingle with other crews. They couldn't sit, you know, the, the Carson hotshots couldn't sit with, you know, the Prescott uh, hotshots and, and discuss strategy uh, together because they had to not only uh, protect themselves, but but also protect others in case they are infected, right? The, these days there are many asymptomatic people walking around. So it's been a very different fire experience. And uh, one other thing that feels very different is that the pandemic has been such big news here that while in summers past, everybody was talking about the fires, everybody was, was sort of tracking how things were happening. This year feels almost like it became sort of, you know, not important. People aren't talking about it. They don't uh, unless they live in a town that has been evacuated, they might not even know that fires have happened and are still happening, not just here, but also all around the southeastern, uh, southwestern, I'm sure, uh, I'm sorry, United States. Yeah, it's certainly not top of mind for people. There's a lot of other stuff going on. Right. Uh, Jared, I know you're in California where there's an argument to be made that fire season never really has a start or an end. Uh, so far this year, the state has not seen any monster fires. I'm knocking on wood. Uh, but it is dealing with the resurgence in coronavirus cases, and I understand that's impacted uh, some of the state's efforts to do prescribed fires, fuel mitigation. Uh, how is that impacting the readiness of crews there for the fires that are sure to come? Yes, well, that's that's all very true. What you've uh, just laid out, Nate, and uh, you know, similar to uh, what Fernando was uh, just speaking of in in Arizona. Uh, there have been some uh, smaller scale incidents. Uh, in fact, there are some happening right now in uh, Fresno County, uh, where I am, uh, on the western side of the county, and also nearby in, in Madera County. And uh, all of those changes that Fernando was just speaking of are, are happening in those uh, fire camps um, with changed procedures. And uh, yes, it's, it, it also affected, as you mentioned in the spring, uh, there was um, some inability, inability on the part of agencies like the Forest Service and CAL FIRE here in California to accomplish all of the prescribed burning that they, they would have liked to. Um, and uh, another thing uh, that I should, um, you know, sort of mention or throw into the this this mix of the story is in California there's a there's a dependence on um, inmate fire crews uh, which um, you know it's sort of a when I think about it there's a there's an intersection of the problems of, of wildfire and um, and and social injustice really uh, or the you know, you think of, you think about the composition of those crews uh, and the rates of incar incarceration uh, for certain groups of, of people, uh, and then COVID. Because what's happened with COVID nineteen is um, many of the facilities, the prisons, have gone on lockdown, uh, or um, some of the uh, inmates have have been released early from their uh, from their sentences. Um, and so this is, you know, it's having an effect on the availability of personnel on the, the human resources. So it is fortunate, knocking on wood, that uh, there haven't been any mega fires or monster fires yet, but they're almost sure to come in, in California. And these challenges are having an effect, uh, you know, on, on crews facing even the smaller scale incidents that we're experiencing right now. I know that that issue of inmate fire crews and a shortage of, of people that are ready to be deployed to fire is a huge issue in California and a lot of the West. Uh, Teresa, I, I wanted to ask you briefly about uh, the community, how communities are dealing with this or how they will deal with this. You know, at this point, we know that communities of color are being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Communities of color are also disproportionately impacted by natural disasters. 
Uh, what are you going to be watching for this fire season as fires come closer to California communities that are also dealing with this pandemic? Well, I think one of the major issues facing uh, American Indian communities, which is the community that I predominantly serve, um, is again, similar to the uh, the impacts that Fernanda and Jared were laying out. You know, our crews are already somewhat minimally staffed. Some reservation fire departments don't have even a full-time uh, 24 seven unit, they have volunteers. Um, and if you're already strapped to find enough uh, personnel to staff and to respond, you know, COVID's just exacerbating that. Um, the other issue too, I think goes to uh, Jared's point that not all the fuel projects for wildland urban interface were able to be completed um, or if they were completed, um, it was just, you know, kind to prioritize the most vulnerable areas of tribal lands. Um, I think going forward with COVID, you know, tribes have sovereignty. So many of the tribes in the state opted to open up their gaming facilities, which is the economic driver for most of those communities. And it's really imperative that those enterprises can stay open, but they're constantly weighing the cost, right? If people are coming in, if they can maintain um, the CDC guidelines for um, social distancing and prevent a surge within their own communities, of course, that would make it safer for their first responders to go out and do their job if they need to. As far as from the community perspective, um, I, de I define community a bunch of different ways, but like the everyday tribal citizen or person that lives within tribal homelands as in terms of their community, I think it's increasingly important that people are prepared. Um, Governor Newsom, prior to COVID, announced the California Preparedness for All campaign, where he put a lot of funding uh, into community organizations through California volunteers. Um, and some of that funding went to tribal organizations um, the Intertribal Emergency Management Association took on a really big portion of trying to roll out a robust uh, community emergency uh, response training that reached all of the tribes from northern, central, and southern California. Um, Northern, Central, and Southern California. And they partnered with LISTOS, which is Spanish for ready, um, and the LISTOS program so that we could really reach uh, kind of the most vulnerable and sometimes uh, underrepresented communities um, in need of preparedness training and resources. Unfortunately, with COVID, the robust trainings that were planned and all of the supplies and information that was um, developed to be um, distributed to the community, that's all kind of been pushed onto the back burner because you can't have 24 people in a classroom and outside doing hands-on um, community emergency response training. But listoscalifornia.org, you can still go online and people can look up their five steps for preparedness and it's really, you know, basic, um, you know, be, you know, get information, stay, stay informed, you know, have your bags ready because unfortunately, just like COVID, it doesn't see any barriers, right, between race and class and um, demographics in our community, neither does a wildfire. Um, and if you live near um, or even far from a community, we know with the winds that we experience in California, that fire can come knocking on your door in a matter of hours. So it's important to still have your bags packed, all your important information ready, and some sort of a plan in place. Again, taking extra precautions because of COVID, making sure you have masks, hand sanitizer, medicines, all of those things ready. And then also a kind of the new thing is like a stay at home box too, right? So if you do have to evacuate and go anywhere else, what are you going to need with you to quarantine? Because you are gonna be going out and putting yourself at risk. Um, the, other, the other important aspect is to also, you know, help your neighbors know what's going on around you. Um, even though we're siloed and we're asked to stay inside, we can still stand, you know, against the fence and ask how they're doing and check in and make sure that um, they have the same information that you do. So if you do have to evacuate or leave, you know, you're going to you're going to have a plan and you're going to be ready. Um, so those are the things that we're pushing out to the community that, you know, like Fernanda said, it's not the fire season uh, threats and risks aren't really making the headline news because that's um, being talked by COVID, which is, you know, incredibly important for us to know and stay informed about. Um, but I think as the as the summer heats up and warms up and we head into fall, especially in California, when the Santa Ana winds will pick up, we need to be just as alert as ever. And if not more so, I think this year. And yeah, I just want to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nate, but I, I just want to add a, a little something because in the, in this uh, whole, you know, preparation and, and, and focus on, on, 
coronavirus COVID, uh, all of this kind of ramped up right as uh, the training uh, that the seasonal crews receive to be ready to fight fires in the fight during the quote unquote fire season, uh, which we know, you know, is sort of like a term that doesn't apply anymore. Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do recall when I was researching for my book, I, I did the um, the basic, you know, uh, wildland firefighter training. We were in a classroom, you know, 24 of us, one, you know, shoulder to shoulder, working together. Um, we were discussing fire, hearing from instructions and instructors in small spaces, and then doing the field training out in the open. But there was a lot of sort of huddle classroom conversation. So I don't know how much uh, that uh, the situation we're living in and the pa pandemic has affected or impacted the training and preparation of crews who will who would be or or are at the ready right now to uh, to jump in when when these fires uh, burn in different parts of, of the uh, of the West. Yeah, it's a challenge, and I've done some reporting on the Forest Service already saying that they have shortages of seasonal firefighters. It's a challenge there, and so you add this on top of it, and that's it's a lot to think about. I want to shift gears a little bit. I know we could probably talk about the coronavirus all day, but I, I don't know if you guys are like me. Uh, I'm a little sick of hearing about the coronavirus, even if I can't stop listening to every story about it. Um, so I want to talk about the term monster fire or mega fires, which are becoming increasingly frequent here in the U.S. and around the world, as we've seen in Australia, as we're seeing now in Siberia. Uh, Jared, you're our resident fire historian. Uh, how do the fires of today compare to what we've seen in this country historically? Well, I, I think, Nate, you're hitting the key there when you talk about the increased frequency of monster wildfires or megafires, because uh, megafires have long been a part of the landscape in terms of spatially massive fires. Uh, but they are, uh, you know, all the data from uh, dendrochronologists, uh, scientists who, who study uh, the age of trees and, and when those fire scars were, were placed on the trees, uh, to um, other folks who, who study old um, ecosystems and the history of ecosystems, uh, you know, indicate that, that megafires, for instance, in the Southwest uh, United States, um, uh, there were huge megafires in uh, the year 1748. Um, they've, they've, they've always been a part of the landscape, uh, but they are getting more frequent. And uh, because in, in most locations, because of changed uh, vegetation structure conditions or fuel conditions, uh, these fires are becoming more severe. Uh, so, in other words, a fire um, in the past, uh, in, for instance, in the 18th century that may have um, burned a, a large area, it, uh, at the same time, it may have burned through without um, burning all of the trees uh, or all of the vegetation in that area. It may have uh, skipped around and left uh, more islands of unburned vegetation uh, than uh, we see in many, many megafires today. A patchwork, um, a patchwork right. of burnt and Right, of exactly. So uh, fire behavior is changing. And of course the, uh, you know, the other thing uh, that's, that's happening is uh, just continuing uh, development in uh, what fire managers and firefighters call the wildland urban interface. Uh, so there's, uh, there's essentially more contact uh, between um, developed areas and areas where these fires are igniting and burning um, so that there's, uh, there's more chance of a, uh, a catastrophe in terms of uh, property damage and, uh, you know, injuries or fatalities for, for people. Um, so the, the, the trend, you know, again, monster wildfires have always been with us, but they're becoming more frequent and more, more destructive. Where I am right now in Montana is not terribly far from where the, the big burn was, the fires in 1910. So mm -hmm. another example. So what, but okay. knowing that fires, mega fires, large fires are increasing in frequency, knowing that we just can't help but build in the wildland urban interface, um, since the nature of fire is sort of evolving and changing, uh, Fernanda, you've done a lot of reporting on how we fight fire. Is that evolving and changing too? 
I would like to say that yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you look at the tools that uh, um, uh, a hand crew uses, um, you know, the firefighters were on the ground um, uh, digging fire line, which are trenches, um, not quite deep, but just a, a space where they, that they clear clearing that they create in the forest to slow the progress of a fire um, uh, until the flames kind of uh, don't have anything else to eat and peter out. Um, uh, these tools are pretty much the same that were used in the big burn that you mentioned, Nate, over um, in um, uh, Wyoming, Montana, you know, uh, uh, a century ago, uh, almost. Um, uh, they are still using tools that a lot of us are familiar with because maybe you have a landscaper who comes to to, your, to do your front yard and, and might use, you know, the types of shovels and, and axes that, wildland firefighters carry with them. Um, they use electric saws and that's still pretty much the way fires are fought. There is uh, on TV, what we usually see is the image of the, the plane dropping fire retardant or helicopter dro dropping retardant on water. But really it's down below on the ground where the crews are that the real job of fighting fires. I mean, the, these are, it's all like little pieces of a puzzle, not little big pieces that work together, you know, but, but it, the, the work on the ground remains pretty much the same. The idea is fire um, uh, eats vegetation. Vegetation is in, in homes and whatever is on the way, firefighters call it fuel. That's what keeps the fire going. And the idea for fire crews on the ground is to uh, starve the fire. And they create these fire lines, which is um, uh, almost a, like a very well rehearsed ballet where each person on the crew has a role and the one behind will build upon the, the task performed by the one in front of him or her. Um, and they will create these openings in the forest so that when the fire, the flames get there, they kind of slow down because there's nothing else to burn there. Right. Uh, and that is extremely dangerous work that that hasn't really changed. Um, in the Arnell in 2013, the fire where 19 firefighters died, one of the biggest issues was, was that they couldn't locate the crew. These days, you know, we can do geolocation maps based on our cell phones, right? Our smartphones. Um, people know where we are. Um, some countries are doing contact tracing with coronavirus, you know, looking at your geolocation data on your phone. Yet, we still have a hard time tracking the exact location and movement of crews fighting fires. Um, so there is definitely a disconnect between all the technological advances we've had and what we have provided these firefighters. And essentially, you know, from my perspective as not a firefighter, but someone who studied fires and had to learn from them and about them um, for a book, um, and it sort of became obsessed with it, um, you know, it, it's largely because we have this attitude about fire that we don't have with other um, natural phenomena. We don't try to fight a hurricane. We don't fight, you know, a, 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 an earthquake, uh, a tsunami, right? We hide, we, we run to higher ground. Uh, but fire, we've, we've historically, humans have had this very interesting relationship of dominance with fire. Um, and, and I think because of that, because of that sort of almost ego, trip that we're into as we try to fight fire, we still believe we can vanquish it. And because we do many times contain these fires um, and declare victory in that way um, uh, and save the town, you know, and that's what everybody focuses on. Um, we believe that we can continue to send these crews out there without much concern about um, what it is that we could and should be doing differently to make sure that they are safe because lives should always come first. Right. Um, but sadly it's only when lives are lost that we start thinking about these things. Um, so that's sort of a long answer <laughs> to yeah. talk about, you know, something that really truly has not changed much. Um, you do seasonal firefighting, right? I don't know if you still do working for NPR, but you did. In my more limber and uh, youthful days, I did, but no, no longer. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the way you learn how to fight fire and fought fires um, in the several seasons that you worked as a seasonal firefighter is no, not much different than after firefighting, wildland firefighter became sort of like more... Uh, professionalized for lack of a better word, you know, and it's not much different than what the new crews were trained just this year, learned to do to go out and fight fires this summer and in the coming months. So, um, you know, we really haven't seen much of an evolution in that. 
Um, and, and that's really dangerous. So I want to I want to talk about a relationship with fire in a second and just the way that whole narrative that you just described about how we think about fire as a society and as people. But I do have one other tactic question sort of that that I'd love to ask you, Teresa. I know that like I, I recently did some reporting on the fires in Australia. I've done some reporting, a lot of reporting on fires in California where there seems to be sort of a growing recognition that there's that indigenous peoples in this country and other countries, Aboriginal people in in Australia dealt with fire and lived with fire in a maybe even a more productive way than we are right now. And I'm wondering, like, could you give me some examples of some of the tactics and how that relationship worked and whether those would be applicable to the way that we manage fires today? Well, I think that the answer to that question goes back to the point that Fernando was making a moment ago about the the sense of fear and dominance we have with fire. And it's one of those natural phenomenon that we tend to think as human beings that we can conquer. And so I think a lot of it stems from a cultural point of view for uh, native people, indigenous people, not just here in the Americas, but like you, like you mentioned in Australia um, and other parts of the world where fire was a tool um, and it was a gift. And so we've lost that relationship and that sense of, uh, stewardship really over it. Um, I think Jared can also speak to this because he definitely um, is more progressed and advanced in his cultural recovery and revitalization efforts with fire. But from my work with uh, our tribal communities and our uh, ecological stewards, you know, there is a growing partnership. I think it's stronger in Northern California and Central California than it is in the South because of our climate and our topography. But there is a growing partnership to revitalize cultural burnings uh, so that we're actually looking at um, the trajectories and pathways of historical fires, the way they would approach a community um, and, and burning appropriately. You know, the fire, um, the Forest Service, when it was started, had a mission to suppress fires. Uh, but as Jared was talking about climate change and um, the history and transformation of these mega fires, you know, in combination with population growth and more people moving out into these wildland urban interface zones, um, it really does create sort of a perfect storm, right, for catastrophe and danger. But um, the premise of cultural burnings is that if we can return to that traditional eco ecological knowledge and those practices and identify these spaces and places and actually start to steward the land, you know, do a, a, a prescription you know, it can still be called, you know, the Forest Service and Cal Fire would call it a prescribed burn. Um, but we're doing it in a way that's identifying native plants that are useful not only for people, but for the animals, for the water, um, and for the other plants surrounding that space and that habitat. Um, so it really takes a team, right, of specialists, community members, um, and today the firefighters. And I think if more of that traditional ecological knowledge or cultural knowledge was brought to bear in the trainings that Fernanda was saying to educate our wildland firefighters that are going out there on the line, um, I think it could really transform the way that we look at not just suppressing fires and putting them out, obviously to save lives and property, that's important, um, but to really change our relationship with the land, right? And so um, to look at it as, again, using fire as a tool, you have to put fire on the ground, as she was saying, to starve it in defense of the fire. Um, and it can be used as a tool to actually revitalize uh, re uh, the land. Um, it can help retain more water. It can bring back animals um, to specific uh, places that are overgrown. Um, so I think looking, you know, shifting the narrative to that, shifting our practices, I think can be really transformative. Um, and these practices have been around for thousands of years, right? So it's not new knowledge. It's just reapplying it um, and kind of decolonizing this narrative and relationship that we have with fire. Jared, could you explain, because I, I mean, I've done a lot of reporting on prescribed fire. I think most people sort of have heard the term prescribed fire, but is there a difference between cultural fire and, and prescribed fire? And if so, could you explain what that is? And could you explain, I mean, Teresa just did a, a lovely job of explaining how you can use fire as a tool, but are there other ways in the practices that you've done uh, that you think might be interesting for people to hear? Sure. Yes, I, I have had the honor and privilege of uh, doing a little bit of collaboration uh, with um, some cultural fire practitioners uh, here in Central California, um, and uh, you know, I've talked with Teresa and others in Southern California, and have been able to learn 
uh, to visit some uh, prescribed and cultural fire events in uh, Northwestern California also. Um, so I've, I've been able to, to learn a little bit about, uh, I guess I would ca characterize the, the differences um, in, in those terms as uh, to, you know, to draw on, on a little bit of history again, uh, uh, because that's the way I am. Uh, <laughs> you know, the prescribed fire is a, is a term that uh, came about in the agencies um, uh, such as the Bureau of Indian Affairs and um, the Forest Service uh, when um, fire practice became, uh, it was becoming more professionalized. And so the, the idea of prescribing a fire means that there is a, a written prescription and it's looking to uh, the burn boss or the person who writes that prescription, writes that burn plan um, as, the, as the professional um, it's, uh, who's, um, it's, it, it's sort of, you know, it's a direct analogy to a doctor writing a prescription to, uh, to cure a patient. And it's Dr. It's, Fire. It's right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then you have, uh, you have objectives, you have written objectives, you have something that all the participants can, can look at. And it's, um, you know, it's part, as I say, of the, the professionalization of the of the practice and the um, the attempt to become uh, more careful and more exacting in your in your prescriptions. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is that prescribed fire is most often focused on fuel hazard reduction. So you're going out to uh, your prescription. Your burn objective is going to include reducing the hazardous conditions by burning when conditions are, are right, um, when the weather conditions are right, for instance, uh, so that you can contain the fire. Uh, and then later when you have, say, you know, 90 mile per hour Santa Ana winds um, or, uh, you know, high temperatures and, and extremely challenging fire conditions and a fire does come through, it doesn't burn as severely because you did that um, prescribed fire um, you know, in the, in the past when conditions were, were right for it and, and easier to control. Um, so, uh, a cultural fire as I've learned about cultural fire from, uh, practitioners, um, you know, again, here in central California, uh, like Ron Good of the North Fork Mono tribe with whom I've, you know, uh, had the great opportunity to work with and, and learn from, um, a cultural fire uh, is, is not necessarily going to, it can involve a written prescription, but it's not necessarily going to involve a written prescription. Um, it's, uh, as, as Teresa was just saying a, a few minutes ago, it draws on, uh, an archive of information that's not necessarily written down, but is, um, time tested and, you know, in many cases, thousands of years old. Um, it can involve the, the idea of reducing the fire hazard or the danger, but um, there's, in a cultural fire, there's most likely going to be other goals that the burners have, uh, like enhancing certain kinds of plants uh, or increasing the, the diversity, the mixture of plants that you have in an area or um, creating conditions uh, that uh, are, are better for certain animals' habitat. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in many cases, um, I, I really, my ears perked up when, when Teresa mentioned that fire is a gift. Uh, it's not something to, to dominate, um, but it's, you know, uh, cultural fire practitioners may view themselves uh, in, a, in a ceremonial context as um, offering a gift to the land, um, which uh, which may have its its reciprocal return, you know, again in um, in spiritual fulfillment, but also uh, in some of these cultural resources like plants that are um, you know better uh, for food purposes or for uh, uh, basket making purposes, 
or to um, provide food for animals. Um, it's a it's a much kind of wider um, goal, I think, uh, uh, that that your typical prescribed burn plan might might be able to incorporate. The idea being, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say um, to that point, for California Indians, for the majority of us, we're acorn eaters up and down the coast from Southern California to Northern California. And using fire was really instrumental in um, the acorns drop. If you had the burn, you know, done in a, in a, at the right seasonal moment um, and culturally prepared, um, then you would have a better harvest because the smoke from the fire, the low burning fire, would actually detour pests from, you know, boring into the acorns and sort of ruining oh. harvest. Um, and then it also... Um, clears away the mulch and the underbrush that can accumulate under the oak trees, you know, um, so that then when they drop, they can actually, you know, go into the ground, those that aren't picked up and then reproduce. Right. So in that way, it was really necessary for a major food staple, you know, like I said, for thousands of years before the Spanish came and uh, wanted to dominate and suppress uh, our fire practices. Teresa, I'm going to think of that acorn example later this summer if I'm choking on smoke at some point. I'm going to think it's not all bad. <laughs> it's not all bad. <laughs> How do we change the narrative? How do we change our relationship with fire? What you guys are describing is, is that, that fire is good in a, in, a, in a way, and it's a part of the landscape. Um, so how do, we, how do we change our societal way of looking at it? Fernanda, maybe I'll ask you with that. I'll give you an example um, of how uh, in looking at the way fires have interacted with communities and the land around these communities, um, you can see uh, you can you can take out the message that fire is tragic or you can take out the message that fire can be helpful and good without necessarily harming the community. You are now this small town here on the mountains in central Arizona in 2013. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there was this, this deadly fire where 19 firefighters of the same crew uh, were killed. Uh, 19 hot shots. Um, the fire burned the west side of town, started by lightning, very common this time of the year, it's monsoon season. So we get lightning and we get rain that evaporates before it hits the ground because the air is still super dry. So it's only now in July, although I haven't seen a single monsoon yet in Arizona. And this time I would have seen them here in Phoenix, but this time of the year, the air is more saturated with moisture. So you actually get the rain that, you know, hit the ground. But anyway, in 2013, this fire near now burned um, the west side of town, um, killed these 19 firefighters out of control. There was no stopping it once the wind picked up and the monsoon winds picked up and, and literally pushed this fire um, that then fed on brush that had not burned in 40 years. And it was dry given that the last rain that they had had was in April and it was negligible rain. So fast forward to three years later in 2016, obviously many times we learn our hardest lessons from the worst of tragedies, right? So the, the little town of Yarnell and its fire chief at the time um, decided to, uh, working with the state of Arizona and um, federal agencies to apply for grants. Uh, they are available and the grants were used to create what, what's known as defensible space. So basically they carve out this buffer zone between the town and the wildlands um, so that in case of fire burns, this fire line is already kind of built there. So the firefighters have a little bit of a wiggle room and the people who live in that town are not immediately threatened because the 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 wild lands don't end right on your front yard or backyard. You know, there is a, a space in between. So there was this fire in 2016, very similar on the east side of Yarnell, started by a lightning strike. Most people have not heard about it because guess what? Nothing happened. The fire, the lightning struck Firefighters dispatched um, to, to the area. Um, there was a command center set up, uh, obviously very re-traumatizing to the residents there, to the families of the firefighters who died. But the fire did not damage a single building in town, did not cause anyone to be uh, killed or seriously injured. Um, and it was put out. And the, the, the reason it was put out is because the community realized that unless it prepares ahead of time, it's left really with no choice but to run away and let the fire burn everything or risk 
killing, you know, dying in the, in the process. So the way to change the narrative is to, you know, from the media's perspective, right. is to emphasize more of the stories of success, more of the stories where fire, actually uh, the relationship between a community and fire, uh, fire crews and fire is one where everybody sort of worked together ahead of time and prepared to allow this force of nature to come and do its thing. You know, um, we can't stop lightning from striking. We can't get more rain in the desert. Well, we wish we could, right? But um, but what we can do is prepare if you live in an area that is prone to burning, prepare ahead of time so that you let the fire burn the, the, the wild lands and, 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 and create conditions that maybe in the future will allow for more acorns to, to sprout, you know, for more trees to grow, for, uh, uh, for the ground to be clean so that you don't have these fires that climb to the tops of trees and then get out of control. Um, so if we start each um, working ahead of time and giving fire its deference, then things won't be as tragic. But the first step to change, I mean, not the first step, but one of the necessary steps to changing the narrative is to highlight more of the stories where things worked out. Not just look at wildfires when something horribly goes horribly wrong, but also look at when things go right and why did they go right and how can we replicate those behaviors so that we have more stories of fires going quote unquote right than quote unquote wrong. That criticism is one I hear frequently from fire ecologists when I got, I'm sure Teresa and Jared, you guys feel this way. It's the way that the media tends to cover wildfire is that when it gets big and it gets bad, people come in and cover it. Um, and, and, and sadly, if I may add, Nate, you know, sadly, um, as someone who has worked <laughs> as a journalist for 20 some years now, you know, it, it's not as sexy a story, right? I mean, people would much rather re read about paradise in California being, you know, completely decimated by a fire and, and the sadness that it came and and maybe the heroic stories of people saving their neighbors. Then they want to read about, hey, there was another fire in this town called Yarnell and and look, they did everything right and nothing happened. Right. Because. Well, nothing happened. What's the story? Um, but we have it doesn't to have the same tension, the good exactly. versus evil. But, yeah. but but I think that that is sort of like a small way of thinking about the way we cover things in general and we consume news in general. We're always looking for the bad outcomes. You know, what about focusing on the positive outcomes? And that can be translated to everything the way, you know, there are horrible uh, examples of how police mistreat people. What are the good examples too, so we can learn from these practices? It's the same with fire. There are many, many examples year after year of communities that prepared ahead of time and didn't burn. But we don't focus on those because people are not quite, you know, editors, frankly, are not really that interested. So that is the perfect segue to the last question I want to ask before we get to Q&A. And it's going to be kind of a lightning round because I want to hear Jared and Teresa, if you guys have a, a suggestion here. All right. So I don't really need to tell you that there's a lot of anxiety in the world right now. The idea of monster fires on top of a pandemic, on top of you know, social injustices that we're all kind of seeing and living with right now is absolutely terrifying to me as a journalist and as a human. Uh, but is there anything that you look at right now that's happening that gives you hope for the future? Teresa, how about you start? Wow. Um, I think every day I still try to wake up um, with a heart of, full of gratitude that I do have my health, that I have a job, um, that I can still help my community. Um, you know, we were talking about earlier the training that the fire departments weren't able to do, but all of our tribal emergency responders have stepped up to be um, points of distribution for PPEs for their community. Um, and our organization, the Intertribal Long-Term Recovery Foundation, worked to get over 150,000 masks delivered so they can go out to all of Southern California tribes, gowns, shields. We partnered with FEMA and Cal OES um, and had to set it all up virtually, right? So people could come in at different times and do, do drive-by pickups. So I think I still am hopeful about humanity um, in the good in humanity to go to Fernanda's point that we do need to look at the positive and look at cooperation and collaboration and our relationships with one another um, in order to to be prepared, right? To, to bolster ourselves against things that are out of our control, right? We, we can't control the pandemic. Um, we're trying really hard, you know, practicing social distancing and doing our part. Um, but I really like her point, and I think this is a key uh mantra for uh, disaster preparedness, right, is that an ounce of prevention is worth um, 
Am I saying it right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, I'm getting it wrong. A pound of cure. You nailed it. A pound of cure. Thank you. I <laughs> needed that. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, you, you kind of have to stay positive. I mean, otherwise you're, you really are just going to be sort of a nihilist, right? And think like, oh, the world's caving in on me. And you're like a chicken little running around. The sky is falling all the time. Um, I see hope with uh, partnerships. Every time there is a major mega fire, we learn more about, again, what we could have, should have, would have done. But then we, you know, in California, at least, and in Southern California, we actually look at those lessons learned really hard. Um, and, and we strive to, to improve our communications, our response, our tools, our strategies. I was mentioning earlier to Jared when we were speaking um, before the session started that, you know, San Diego Gas and Electric, you know, it's a part of the, the big infrastructure of our, you know, in, um, utilities in the state. But after the 03, 05, 07 wildfires in, in San Diego County, they installed anemometers on all of their infrastructure throughout the county. And they're the largest um, weather station in the nation. They've used that technology to measure fuel, to measure temperature, to measure uh, wind speed so that they can have prescribed power shutoffs. That's not a sexy, um, easy choice to make because especially in the middle of summer or late fall when we're having extreme heat, um, but the shutoffs are, are strategic and they're getting better all the time at um, shutting them off just only for a short period of time so that that fire danger um, won't ignite one of their lines and then you know perhaps endanger a community and have to uh, risk evacuations. Um, so I think, you know, we can learn together. Um, we have to learn to live in the places that we inhabit. We have to build relationships and connections, not just with human beings and technology, but also the landscape and ecology around us. And I think if we can take those lessons to heart, um, there's hope. Jared, are you a hopeful guy? I am hopeful. And, you know, listening to uh, both uh, Fernanda and, and Teresa just now, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, thinking about the, the idea that uh, successes aren't often celebrated and that's because nothing happens. So how do you how do you write a story about that? Um, but but part of that story, if we could write it more often, I think would be partnerships and, and relationships among agencies and, and communities. And, you know, re just really quickly, uh, I've been thinking lately about, um, you know, it's a piece of jargon that's been uh, making the rounds in, in fire circles, which is uh, potential operational delineations, meaning, um, yeah, fire, fire planners or fire managers are looking at um, potential places to do prescribed fire and um, implement uh, fuel breaks, you know, fuel treatments. Uh, so they look like uh, potential operation delineations, they, the acronym is POD. They look like little pods on the, on the landscape, but what you can maybe start to do with that is work with the local community and that, that local knowledge so that you're not only working on uh, reducing fire hazard, but thinking, you know, what is our what is our relationship with the landscape within this pod, and uh, how can we how can we work with the land, uh, for instance, to get more surface water into streams, um, you know, uh, utilizing uh, that idea of you know maybe using cultural fire, um, and uh, just a couple last thoughts that I'll I'll leave off with is uh, would be, um, you know. What we really need to do is, is change that relationship with fire or transform our, our idea of what fire is instead of a, an enemy or evil or something to dominate. Um, you know, and there, I think there is an analogy to, um, to floods. You know, yes, floods can be very destructive when they come through, but if you plan ahead uh, and maybe build a little basin, you can, you can use that flood water uh, to do some good things. Uh, to grow some good crops so you know back to the idea of of islands within within a mega fire or a monster fire uh maybe you could start to design things so that you have uh you end up with an archipelago of islands that a fire can burn through or flow around uh in the way that that water would flow you know start to think of it more as a as a flowing source of of energy rather than simply a destructive force. Um, and uh, uh, the only other thing I'd add is, uh, you know, I think in the southeastern 
U.S. right now, there are some great examples of communities uh, coming together uh, and doing uh, a lot of community-based uh, prescribed fire, uh, for instance, together, working together. Um, and they're also having things, they're calling them fire festivals, you know, to, to come together and, and celebrate, learn together, have learning exchanges, uh, but also have, have fun together and, and learn that fire can be a positive force and something that you can work with rather than only something to fear and fight. That's very cool, but they should probably rebrand because the last fire festival didn't go so hot. <laughs> That's true. <great. Yeah. laughs> and remind me, so POD, what is that, what is that acronym for again? Uh, potential operational delineations. So they're delineating on, on maps potential areas to, um, to fight the head of a fire, but also delineating, you know, fire breaks. So they, they, they look like uh, they're enclosing certain areas um, into, into pods. It's very working, cool. You know, Leave working. it to the Forest Service to make a very cool idea <laughs> right. sound very boring. Right? <laughs> exactly. All right, I want to get to the Q&A section because we've got some great questions coming in. Um, and one of them is one that I, I, it's a brilliant question. I'm actually really interested in this. You know, given the fact that the wildland urban interface is one of the most rapidly developing places in the United States right now, is there a way for us to build in the wildland urban interface that mitigates fire risk? And should people that build in the wildland urban interface have to pay to help mitigate those risks? I can take that on uh, somewhat. Well, in California, you know, Fernando, you were mentioning um, Yarnell, the fire that burned on the eastern side of the town that they invested in doing the fire break and defensible space for the homeowners. That's pretty much standard Cal Fire protocol for anybody that lives in the, the WE areas, the, the, the wildland urban interface areas. Um, if they drive by and see that you don't have 50, 100 feet of defensible space, you could be ticketed or fined. Wow. Um, and so a lot of community organizations work like our organization, a lot of the CERT programs, uh, fire safe councils um, in San Diego, Southern California, work to, to create opportunities for homeowners to maintain and manage that, that defensible space by having um, chipping days, right? Debris removal days. Um, people will join together and uh, volunteers will come and you know, help you clean your house and clear that, that um, debris away. Um, but I think, one of the projects that we're working on right now, and I think this would be useful for homeowners that live in areas with recurring fires. And you know, every year there might be the lightning strike or there's going to be the Santa Ana winds. And, you know, there could be a rogue ember and, and, a, and a mega fire could start. Um, the, we're working with two tribal fire departments, um, the uh, La Jolla Reservation Fire, who experienced um, a 90% uh, burned land uh, with the 2007 Pumacha fire and the San Pasquale Fire Department. Um, we're working with Valley Center and Palomar communities, which are neighboring towns to those reservations, to uh, find a program to uh, give every homeowner, or at least right now, maybe to pilot it, like elders and people with access and functional needs, um, a, a fire blocking gel. So when they do have to evacuate, that's the sort of last ditch effort that they can spray down their home. You could use your garden hose to attach it to this um, package and spray down your home and it would give it an extra chance um, as you evacuate and leave. Um, it's been proven to work. Um, some of the neighboring communities have already received county funds to distribute these to um, homeowners. Um, but the tribes are not excluded because of jurisdiction are not included in that grant because of jurisdictional issues. So we're currently working to craft a, a, a grant proposal with some of our donors to get um, enough gel for about 300 homes um, to pilot it and see if we can save some property. So I think yes and no as my answer to that question. Okay. Yes, you need to you need to take responsibility, and yes, you're going to need to pay for it. But I think there's cooperative ways that you can work with your government um, and community organizations to subsidize those costs. And then one, one thing that I think is important in that, and I'll make it quick, is that um, when you build in the wildland urban interface, and I'm talking more about these uh, uh, more upscale developments, you know, million dollar homes, everybody, I mean, lots of people dream retirement home is, is that home that overlooks a forest or a beach, right? Um, so when you build there, uh, and in Arizona is very common, uh, homeowners associations fees, part of that is used to pay for the mitigation in the off season. So they will hire, say, an inmate crew to come and, and trim the trees and, and, 
and clear the forest floor around uh, and so forth. But I think that, that there has to be uh, an understanding from the part of the homeowner that once you build a home in the interface, there is a risk that you will lose that home. Uh, you can never expect, I think the biggest, uh, some of the biggest tragedies happen because there's so much pressure from the community uh, and the more up upscale or affluent the community, the more the pressure uh, comes from higher ups because they have connections to the governor, or the, you know, the senator um, to put another crew out there, get other people to to put out this fire because it's going to destroy, you know, these homes. I think there has to be an understanding that it's an accepted risk. You're going to buy, buy this house. You're going to build it. It's going to be beautiful. And you're going to invest a part of your money to take care of that space to hopefully never have to lose your home to a fire, but it is possible that it will happen and it has to be accepted so that we don't uh, collectively put the pressure on the young men and women who are on the fire lines to put themselves at risk and, and then have things such as what happened in, in the are now happen again. I would just add to that for, for tribal communities, you know, um, our reservations were the last bit of our ancestral territories, if we are lucky that were assigned. And so they don't necessarily have the luxury of saying like, you know, we, we built this house here and we want to be, you know, we want to be here. We were placed there. And for, for many community members, um, they don't want to leave. Um, but these increasing risks because of climate change, um, uh, make it really deadly for them to stay. Uh, and so the, the interface, we just call that the reservation. We just call that the backcountry. Um, and it's a term that has come up lately. Um, and we've really had to do a lot of education and, and um, outreach to our members to say, you know, you do have some responsibility in this, even though your family didn't choose to be here, um, because these threats are real and they're coming with more frequency. Um, so, so that's just one distinction I, I like to say. And then that's our homeland. If it burns, we can't move and go anywhere else. There, you know, we have to go back and rebuild. That's a really good point, because I know that the, the conversation, especially with climate change, of managed retreat, of of actively planning to vacate areas that people live now because of the changing climate, uh, that, that severely complicates it. The idea of relocation for different people in this country means very different things and has a, mm -hmm. a long yeah. historical context. Um, so I have a question here uh, that came in. Are the powers that be, and that's in quotes, actually committed to the well-known prevention measures needed to prevent mega fires from happening. Jared, do you feel strongly about that? Putting you on the spot, uh, bud. Well, that's, that's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I, and I certainly can't speak, uh, for the powers that be. Um, and, uh, you know, it will, um, it, 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 it's going to take, uh, a lot of broad based community based, um, work and labors of love together to, to transform the landscape and transform communities relationships with, with fire. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's it's difficult to answer the question in the sense that uh, you know as I was speaking of earlier, uh, mega fires have have always been with us, um, and you're you're not necessarily going to prevent um, a fire, a large fire, from happening, but you can certainly create the conditions uh, where you uh, you don't have the destruction from a monster wildfire that we've, that we've seen recently. And that, that might mean um, a community, you know, even an urban community going out into the, to use quotes again, quote, unquote, wildlands um, to, to work with that land and, and create the conditions so that you have fires that burn through certain areas without picking up uh, a lot of momentum and, and burning in heavy fuel areas, you know, even out in what might seem like remote areas of a forest, for instance. Um, so you start, you start thinking of, um, uh, you know, here in Fresno County, say in the, the city of Fresno, uh, it, it might do well for all of the people here, the powers that be, or for all of the people to push the powers to be, to think of um, the forest in the Sierra Nevada as part of our home, 
you know, in the way that uh, maybe indigenous people think uh, not just of homes or houses, but of a homeland. Um, so there, there are benefits to going out and working with the land in terms of uh, water quality and smoke reduction. Um, because uh, everyone, for instance, here in the Central Valley uh, in California has a lot of experience with heavy smoke from, from mega fires in the, in the past decade. You know, so how can you create conditions, uh, maybe by having smaller prescribed fires, a series of smaller prescribed fires, so that you choose to get a little bit of smoke uh, spaced out over time, rather than a, a hugely, um, uh, you know, hazardous uh, amount of smoke uh, during during a wildfire event. Um, so there's a there's there's a lot of work uh, that that could be done, and that we could push the powers that be toward you know that's what that's what we have to do is is tell the powers uh what they ought to be doing there's a brilliant fire ecologist here that i've interviewed in missoula at the montana fire lab a couple of times who's basically said that you know you can't choose if we want fires but we can choose when we want them do we want small ones that are manageable or do we want these big mega monster fires that are nearly impossible to to contain or corral uh, and that's always something I think about when we enter a fire season. All right, we've got time for about one or two more questions. And so uh, as an educator, where can I find information about native peoples who dealt with fire? And uh, I didn't know that smoke from fire would keep insects from boring into trees. Or neither did I. So great question. Well, I would start, I mean, I can speak to California and Jared, you can probably add on to this list, but um, I think the most recent Book to gain a lot of attention is MCAT Anderson's Tending the Wild, um, which really provides an in-depth ecological and historical look at um, the stewardship of the land that the California Indians practiced. And one of the uh, pieces of that book, you know, talks in great deal about the use of fire as a tool. Um, my mind's blinking, but there are books that preceded her as well. Um, Jared, you might want to go. There's the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. Um, they're an online resource um, that you can utilize. Um, I mean, even if you read accounts from uh, Florence Shipbeck um, in San Diego County, she her book Pushed Into the Rock, she talked about the way that, um, you know, Southern California tribal community members were really stewards. They weren't just occupants of the land, right? We weren't just sort of mindlessly wandering around, that we actually um, cultivated the land and um, and watched over it and cared for it. Um, but you can find my contact information and I could give you a more in-depth um, bibliography. But Jared, if anything pops off the top of your head, um, you can jump in. You mentioned some, some great sources, uh, Teresa, for, for educators. Uh, I'll say you can also, you know, Google my information up uh, and, and look at my website where I have um, one of the links that I have on the front page there, the website is uh, to a curriculum uh, that Ron Good of the North Fork Mono Tribe and I wrote a few years ago, and it's now um, w housed on the on the web along with lessons from many other regions, uh, and it includes some fire lessons, some some lessons on indigenous fire. It's uh, uh, through an organization called the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Um, there, uh, there's also, as Teresa mentioned, um, you know, down in San Diego, there are some educational resources that you could, uh, find, um, regarding, uh, Kumeyaay fire, uh, in terms of lessons from, uh, I believe it's the Kumeyaay Degeno Land Conservancy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if there would be a way for us to provide, links in the uh, recording that's going to be made of, of, of this event or not, but uh, there are, they're out there if you, if you look for them and I can, I can help you look for them if you want to contact me. Look uh, for a lot of people sliding into your DMs later, Teresa and Jared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's about all the time we have. Uh, that's the last question I think we're going to be able to take tonight. Um, this video will be published on Zocalo site, zocalopublicsquare.org. Again, that is zocalopublicsquare.org and as a podcast, because I know everybody's listening to podcasts now. Uh, you can read a summary of this discussion on the website, along with interviews uh, with tonight's panelists. Thank you again to all of our panelists tonight, Fernanda Santos, Teresa Greger, 
Jared Dahl Aldern, for joining this conversation and to the Huntington USC Institute on California in the West for co-presenting tonight's event. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to all of you that were listening and joining us during these strange and sad times. Please be well, take care of yourselves and others, and be safe. Good night.